morning, my name is Gus and welcome to the Somewhat Daily News Backup. This is a Somewhat Daily News Backup show because we do it somewhat daily, which is, and those somewhat days are Mondays and they are Wednesdays. Today is a Monday, uh, it's Monday the 1st of March, so we thought we'd do one. And by we, I mean me, and of course, the wonderful, the charming, the blue mountaineering, Peter Burns. How are you, Peter? I'm very well, thank you. And everyone at home, don't forget to pinch and punch people around you because of that weird thing where you do that on the first of the month for some reason. Why did that come from? That's got to have some weird etymology, like some strange backstory. But like, it was such a crap thing to do at school. I did do it a lot. I remember. Yeah. You sat, Gus, you're the kind of, I'm pausing because I'm waiting for you to tell me the story of how you did it all the time because you seem like yeah, the kind of person who would have. Of course, people, yeah, pinch and punch for the first day of the month and then, and then it Obviously, it closed with a, a slap on the back, so you can't get me back. And rhyming oh. back with back always, like, it never sat well with me. <laughs> like, that's lazy. There's got to be a better would, way. You would still do it and be like, I'm so sorry I had to do that. Like, it's just yeah. lazy. But uh, <laughs> it is the first of a new month. So uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, and this is a new show where we'll do the news. I see lots of lovely faces or names in the chat all saying they're starting their week very motivated. They're like, I'm feeling very motivated. Uh, I think I saw Scully before saying they've already done their morning shop. Uh, Diablo Kyle, hope you've all had a good weekend. Yeah, I hope everyone had a great weekend. Yours was good, Pete, I take it. Oh, uh, well, we had this conversation earlier. No, I hurt my back and didn't do much. <laughs> I forgot you told me that story. Yeah, that's a terrible weekend. Uh, yeah, sorry uh, to hear about that. I hope you're feeling better. a nerve twinge in the uh, probably eighth vertebrae. Oh, well, uh, why don't I give you a big, strong slap on the back next time I see you and I'll, I'll you cure that for you. For, that's some for, chiropractic 101. I'll slap you for what ails you. Um... <laughs> This is the news, and we, of course, can't do the news without you patrons backing us up, you lovely followers, etc. But we can't do it because of one particular hero pocketeer, and that is, of course, Tim. Get your exclamation mark Tim's out in the chat because he is the one who is here making the, the news possible for all of us. But he's also making things possible for many people out there in the internet world, and that is coding courses. He runs a series of coding courses through the Learn Programming Academy. Uh, he runs the best Learn Programming Academy, I believe, that's out there on the internet. You can check out the link that was there before and go and read the PDF that tells you all about the courses he runs. The majority of them are all uh, under $20. They're video-based courses, so it's a great way to get into coding if that's what you're keen on. Um, but uh, we are keen on diving into some hot, hot headlines. The hottest of which, of course, so was hot. so hot. Some some hot pocket takes. I will get that up and running. The hottest of which was uh, a lot to do about the PlayStation State of Play, which happened last week. If you want to see any uh, and all of our reactions to that, we do have up on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash back pocket channel, uh, a reactions video where the four of us, Nick, myself, Stephanie and Peter, all watched the State of Play. There we are, another early morning stream. We're now streaming ourselves streaming. This is this is meta stuff. Uh, I like it. That's that's an. Let's just watch this. Yeah. Hang on, let me just dial it back you in. Said this whole oh, thing why not? Up. I said let's all say hello. Uh, hello, everybody. I look so much sleepier there than I am very uh, sleepy this morning. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Of that's that. enough of that. Uh, we do watch the entire <laughs> state of play, uh, all the game announcements that were there and our reactions and observations and a bit of summary at the end of that. So you can jump across to the YouTube channel and check that out. That is old news. Let's get into some new news and the newest of news that you could poke a stick at, you could Pokemon stick at. Peter, Pokemon <laughs> news because the Pokemon company... <laughs> Shut up, it's a tenuous link. Uh, the Pokemon Company <laughs> had a presentation last Friday, I believe it was, uh, where they announced a heap of Pokemon news, uh, including remakes of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Uh, this was basically a, a remake. That oh, shit. What's wrong? Did we? Did our stream just collapse? It's had a crash, I think. You've had a crash. Uh-oh. Let's see what everyone has to say. Maybe, yeah, Parsec is freaking out. No, all good. We're still going, we're up, but I can't. I can't control the stream right now. Okay, Blob says we're here. We're here, Miss Silver. We're here. So right. Oh, okay. We're still there, but the okay, Peter's lost. recovered. Peter's recovered. recovered. There it is. Can I just say that might have been the most dramatic reaction to the announcement of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remake. Oh my Peter God. just looks down and goes, "Oh shit!" I was like, <laughs> "I want your reaction on this because these are remakes of." Uh, now called Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Pokemon Shining Pearl. And these are updating the old DS game up with the current, uh, it's kind of the current engine that we've had our most recent Pokemon game in. Um, mm. 
This was reported by Polygon saying that uh, these are the remakes that aesthetically are up to date with cute, colorful new styles uh, and the sense of scale uh, of the original game, town and roots have all been carefully preserved. Uh, that's what the Pokemon company said. Peter, did you play these originals uh, in the original form, I should say? And are you looking forward to this new uh, remake? I don't recall if I played Diamond or Pearl. Uh, I probably did. But you play one Pokemon, you played them all. Well, okay, let me Let's jog your honest. let me jog your memory and say, yep. did you pick from any of the original three starter Pokemon? And these are some iconic sounding Pokemon. There was, mm -hmm, of course, mm -hmm. Turtwig, Chimchar, and P Piplup. <laughs> I definitely played it because I had an Infernape at some point. Infernape was the like full evolution of Chimchar, which is a little fire monkey, which is pretty cool. Oh my god, I was kind of saying it like, I don't remember any of these Pokemon, but yeah, <laughs> they just sound like fake words. After a game like Bugsnax comes along and makes these stupid sounding things on purpose, it's like, it yeah. makes Pokemon sound really daggy by comparison. Um, so I think these ones were, I think this was the first uh, DS. Right. Uh, that is a chunky not. looking old school DS from all accounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, they, you know, they, they were pixel art back in the day. Um, they've been turned into like, I think the aesthetic has been, uh, maintained, but they've become like 3d assets, obviously. Sure. Um, uh, I'll take pixel art over the 3d assets any day of the week. I don't think Pokemon's ever had a problem with not looking good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it's got more danger looking bad as a 3d game than it does as I pixel art. I totally pixel agree. Art is gorgeous. I would say the um, 3d variation kind of looks like if anyone's been following the shocking evolution of the harvest moon games, they just continue to try mm -hmm. and make themselves more and more like rounded and 3d and they look shocking compared to like the old super Nintendo version, which was a very, yeah, early Pokemon pixelated kind of cute game. And so, yeah, you run that risk of going to everything looks like a pop vinyl, Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, like, I know there's been, like, a lot of criticism of the look of this game, which I find weird. Like, mm. uh, again, yes, I think pixel art is, is better, and Nintendo could have made more money by just putting classic Diamond and Pearl out on the eShop <laughs> as a pixel art thing, and it, they wouldn't have had to touch it. But um, they've tried to modernize it. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, the problem that i have with it it looks like there's like three different styles right there's the combat engine and then there's like the overworld engine and they don't quite match up you've got like mm. the pop vinyl little squashed figures in the in like the isometric view yeah and then it jumps into the combat which looks to me and i didn't play uh sword and shield but I played Sun and Moon. It looks pretty similar to that. Yeah, that's the one I'm I remember having. Has a, I remember having a lot of lag in the combat engine of Sun and Moon. Um, obviously, that's older older tech, so I assume it runs well on the Switch. I didn't play Sword and Shield again. Sure. Um, but yeah, like this looks these all these characters look like they're well proportioned, whereas here they look cute. Mm. Um, and I don't have a problem with either look. I just find it weird that they don't match. <laughs> yeah, they, the, the blend isn't there. And so suddenly you're jumping in and out of these two uncohesive kind of styles, which, yeah, yeah look, it's still all cutesy. It's still all colorful, but I agree with you. It's like a, as a, a final finish, I feel like they've obviously gone for that with the, because it's remaking a top down kind of, uh, yeah, Game Boy style game. So they want it to still replicate that style. I would love yeah. to see uh, the Pokemon company go along the lines of something like Octopath Traveler and stuff, which is that like HD 2D, engine where it looks like you've got a 3d world with cute little 2d sprites and stuff running around like that would tap into the nostalgia of those pixel like characters but do it in like a, a higher polished 3d engine or something like that i think they could be cleverer about it to be honest um yeah you want yeah, you, I, yeah. I, I i am probably gonna play this because i feel like playing a pokemon game again because okay. i haven't played one in a while and um the last thing i played was a bit of let's go I can't remember if I played Pikachu or Eevee, yeah. which is a remake of the originals and like they'll always be closest to my heart. But um, I just didn't like the Pokemon Go style uh, capturing and training and stuff in those games. Um, I just kind of like it, it was maybe a nicer way to grind, but it was still a grind. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I feel like a classic grind and this is going to have the classic grind <laughs> by you, the looks of it. So. Did you play with that, uh, that Switch Pokemon Pokeball controller? 
I think I, yeah, I think because I played a little bit of it at the spawning office when I was in for a shoot or something. Yeah. And you guys had one in there and I was like, cool. <laughs> a, friend, a mutual friend of ours went to E3 that year on the flight to LA playing it with the controller, but with headphones in. So, and didn't realize that about halfway through the flight that the Pokeball was making noises because they had headphones in. So, every time they shook it, it was like, I'm making noises. And they obviously flew for like four hours while passengers around them, like shaking a toker ball <laughs> next to a game. I was like, how obnoxious. <laughs> as good you get oh man um Angel. this does not look like a game i will be playing i've sort of fallen away from the pokemon series year on year uh but a pokemon game that does spike my interest a little bit more which was announced as well is a new pokemon open world game uh pokemon legends i'm gonna say Ar- arceus do you reckon i'm right on that one yeah arceus uh, that's how i read it arceus maybe yep uh, uh <laughs> this was announced to be coming to nintendo switch in early 2022 um and this looks far more ambitious in terms of uh where the pokemon games have gone in the direction um getting some very strong breath of the wild vibes from this but uh in a report on polygon from julia lee the gameplay trailer shows a trainer being presented with three starter pokemon from a variety of regions uh and what we're seeing here is these very sprawling lovely looking open world uh environments uh the game is set in the Sinnoh region uh, or takes place in the Sinner region uh, and features uh, trainers that do look similar to the trainers you play as in the Diamond uh, and Pearl game we just mentioned, but with old school, like an old school Japanese twist. Uh, the trailer at the beginning mentions this happens a long time ago. So are we looking at a sort of prequel of sorts, a reimagining of how the Pokemon universe began or started? Peter, what are your hot takes? Yeah, so uh, this is the Sinnoh region and so is Diamond and Pearl. Yep. Sinnoh first appeared in Diamond and Pearl. This is ancient Diamond and Pearl, even to the point where they have like uh, wooden Pokeballs and it's like a feudal Japan kind of setting, (laughs) Um, which is cool. Uh, There's a different lineup of um, starter Pokemon. I guess the the kinds of common Pokemon in the the region changed over the years. These are Rowlet, Um, Alola and Cinequil, Cyderquil. (laughs) <laughs> I, this apple, is what apple cider quill. apple cider quill. <laughs> peter is in part of the news this morning as well because we're all like who knows the most about pokemon it's like peter you're up <laughs> yeah I, pro- I have definitely played the most uh yeah cinderquill was from the second games i think it was this one of the starters from the second the gold and silver <laughs> phoenix align gus what the fuck it's like i'm, I'm not good at pronouncing names in general let alone pokemon names give me a cut me some slack come on uh i want to be i want to be excited for this this is the game pokemon game i've always wanted you've talked about this uh, i remember in the past being like i just want them to like let me have that experience of going through the fields and, and throwing and there's pokeballs. been so many there's been so many like fan projects mm. like starting something like this getting shut down by nintendo like it's felt forever that this was an inevitability um this doesn't look very good. No, it does not. <laughs> um, uh, that's partly because of uh, this being a very early build. Yeah. Um, it, it was interesting as well in the Pokemon uh, presentation that they did. This was the trailer they showed off initially as just a standalone trailer. And then I believe yep. they had a, a one of the company directors or uh, developers talk through the game a little further. And they did have UI over this footage. So they had, like right now we're seeing what feels like, as, as you said, a very early proof of concept almost because there's like no button interfaces and it's like, you know, it's very rare for a game to just strip it out of all those things. Um, so, yeah, they were showing the same footage, the same battles, but with a kind of like light UI over the whole thing, which did look a bit more like a game versus what this is, which is like, this will ne- it'll never look like this. Um, also, yeah. like running, I-, I thought initially when I saw this, there was like a slightly lower frame rate on the models. And I was like, oh, maybe that's a stylistic choice. They're going for some kind of like Saturday yeah. morning cartoon. And then, no, it dipped in and out of that. So, yeah, real, not a worry, but like it's strange that obviously they can't get smooth frame rate it must be such early uh it's it's one of those you damned if you do damned if you don't things like overwatch 2 like the footage they showed us of that being like this is an in development concept that we're just toying with the devs are playing with and they think it's fun yeah it probably won't launch and it's like this is obviously too early to make a call on what this is going to play like so why show us what i think is awful looking footage <laughs> bad frame rates really like empty world yeah 
really low saturation i mean it just cut to a more colorful picture but pokemon is like the most colorful game franchise and this is like this is really kind of desaturated and paired back there's still colorful assets but it feels like it's been desaturated in a way that like fits alongside uh uh Breath of the Wild. It looks like models um, are running around in a in a non in a world from another game. Like they've plopped these characters into like a sort of placeholder world, which is a generic Nintendo colorful open world. So, yeah, uh, like, yeah. and why not? Because right now we see at the very bottom of the screen not actual gameplay footage. A uh, da yeah. Like we know that, <laughs> but then why not in that gameplay footage put work in progress? Not a res- this does not reflect the final product. Like which we see all the time, and sometimes again, I, I'm just like splitting hairs now. But it would be nice to see that and be like, okay, cool. This is just like this is literally their first tech demo, and they're like, this is what we want to try and start making. Um, I have hope yeah. for this. I think this is the the way I've always wanted to play a Pokemon game from the beginning. Like you said, they've had heaps of opportunities. They keep falling back on the nostalgia train and saying, you know what? It's everything you remember from that first Pokemon Red. It's like let's break the boundaries out of here and and if they're going to follow another game in suit just from speculation i'd say a breath of the wild kind of vibe is is a good one to go towards so i'm i'm excited about that at least yeah yeah they say at the end of the trailer it says uh early 2022 is the launch um yeah which again is a concerning date for me take take another year because it looks like they've got all that be a couple of years they got all that pokemon snap to uh to work on in between now and then which is going to be perfect which is a perfect game as trailers go, that one did look far more uh, interesting. So jump online, have a look at that one if you haven't seen it already. Um, from more interesting, exciting news to the sad part of the news. Welcome to sad news, Peter, is what I'm going to call sad it. Sad news. Sad news. Hit me. Uh, Hit me. In some sadder news, uh, Polygon again reporting that Bioware and publisher Electronic Arts are giving up on Anthem. RIP Anthem 2021. Uh, it is officially now uh, stated that Anthem Anthem Next or Anthem 2.0 is coming to an end. Uh, I think we've queued up some footage, but also my favorite part of Anthem, which is the music from the game. So we're just going to have some backing music here while we go through the story. Um, Bioware said in an update on the status of Anthem that the studio will continue to run the current live service for Anthem, but in its current form, um, that's as far as it will go. Uh, there will be no updates, there will be no attempt to rejig, revitalize, and reboot uh, the Anthem series. Uh, in this, and they've quoted as saying, in the spirit of transparency and closure, we wanted to share that we've made the difficult decision to stop our new development work on Anthem, aka Anthem Next. Uh, Bioware executive producer Christian Daly said in a post on the Bioware blog that um, they will however continue to keep anthem live running uh sorry a uh, service running as it exists today uh they noted that uh things like COVID 19 that the pandemic work from home orders had a huge impact on their productivity which I, I totally believe but at the same time the game never got off on the right foot so uh this is bad news for anthem fans whoever you are um peter <laughs> were you one of them at all and no, I, are I you never, sad to see it go <laughs> i never even touched it um And not that I didn't think it, oh, maybe I did play like the first 10 minutes and got confused in that hub that they built that was like (laughs) beautiful and tiny. Sure. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I was kind of waiting for this to get good. Like I'm I'm, uh, impressed that they supported it for this long. Um, You know, there is the the old sunk cost fallacy and it's like, yeah. um, they've decided they reached the point where they're like, we've sunk enough cost <laughs> uh, and it's not worth rebooting is next, um, which is a shame. I was really hoping next would work. And oh, like, it's still a very good looking game this couple yeah. of years later. Uh, so yeah, disappointing, but uh, I mean, put the team onto something new and hopefully that sticks. Well, I think in terms of new new games, but for old property seems to be the focus because uh, rounding out that comment um, again from um, Daly, he said that game development is hard. Decisions like these are not easy. Moving forward, we need to laser focus our efforts as a studio and strengthen the next Dragon Age and Mass Effect titles while continuing to provide quality updates to Star Wars The Old Republic. So it looks like, yeah, um, it, it feels to me, and I want to ask you this in the sense of that they just couldn't shake that initial bad juju that came from the game's launch, that came from a mixture of not really providing the game with such ambition that it was shown off in the original E3. Do you think that, like, I do believe COVID and and heaps of other factors would have played into this um, pressure from EA, all that kind of stuff. But do you Mm -hmm. think just the online sort of stigma that was attached to this game was the reason it just was never allowed to, to soar? 
To soar. Mm. <laughs> uh, I think in part, yes. But also, I think they had this, like, uh, it's just because the game wasn't what people wanted. Like, sure. It, not so much this, this, the stigma of it. It was that if the stigma was there and they had pivoted the game quickly and been able to market the new concept, uh, I, th- I think they would have had an opportunity to, to capture some market. But I think the game just was what it is what it is. They've mm-hmm. taken this long to kind of turn around 2.0 next, or at least to start thinking about how they're going to turn it into next. And so there's been no marketing for it since, right? It's like, what do you market a dead thing? They yeah. knew it was a dead thing. So they're not going to, it just hasn't been in the public eye. No one's talked about Anthem except is Anthem dead? Uh, and so it just was never being pushed as a thing that people should try again. Um, yeah, it never really even had those like minor steps to show that there was continual support or like, or maybe it's on its way up. It just, you're right, it went it went dark in terms of online and the only mentions you ever heard were either jokes or sort of continual negative um, things about it. I, I should say I played a fair bit of it at the beginning and I would say I really enjoyed like the minute to minute gameplay, but I think the biggest problem people had with it was just the overall grindiness and the labor of the gameplay that you were made to do, um, which makes itself very apparent after a couple of hours. You're like, oh, this feels really exciting. You know, given the story stuff can be a bit convoluted and you can look past that and be like, oh, but I really enjoy the action. And then do that action for like two more hours and realize that it's on loop or it's on repeat a la, you know, Marvel Avengers kind of style. It's very hard to then stay invested. Um, I know Steph really enjoyed pushing into it because she just like loved that minute to minute gameplay. But if you didn't get the hooks in or if it didn't get the hooks in, I feel like that was the sort of main negativity, which is sad because it's a very polished game. There's some very talented people behind it. And at the end of the day, to see loss of support for any game like this, uh, on any scale, I think is is a bad thing for gaming. Um, to me, the uh, the silver lining is that there's been like because it's a sci-fi game. There's been mm-hmm. a lot of uh, devs who have spent a bunch of time in this engine who are going to use this engine to make Mass Effect. <laughs> and That's like, a good point. <laughs> <laughs> anything that like just consider this like a, a test <laughs> build for yeah. the next Mass Effect. And cool. <laughs> Use the use all the beautiful stuff you've learned. So it's going to be a very sparkly, very shiny looking Mass Effect, whatever the next title is. Yeah. Uh, yeah so R.I.P. Uh, Anthem for twenty twenty one. I mean, go out there and play it if you're still keen. Uh, I'm sure it'll go down to discount price. Is it free to play yet? It'll be free to play soon. I'm sure as it goes into its into its death throes uh, at the moment. But uh, yeah, long live not long live long remember Anthem. <laughs> <laughs> I think you uh, say long live the king when the king dies. Long live oh, the no, king. Oh, no, you say the king is dead, long live the king being the next king. So Yeah, there you go. Long live Mass Effect. Long live Mass Effect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on, uh, a quick story about PlayStation 5 uh, is that it is going through a firmware update that will allow users to upgrade the internal storage. Uh, this is, of course, the internal storage slot that is there as part of the PS5 that hasn't actually been able to be accessed as of yet. Um, this was reported on uh, Polygon and... And uh, Bloomberg saying that Sony Corp is preparing to open up the PlayStation 5 for internal storage upgrades this summer. Now, I believe that'll be our winter. This winter. This yep. winter, um, that'll lift a bottleneck that prevents gamers from having more than a few uh, games on their console because a lot of people are struggling with the amount of storage on the PlayStation 5. I believe it's set to around 650 gig um, mm. for storing games and apps. And you've got things like COD coming through, which, or COD Black Ops and all that kind of stuff. They're like 130 gig for the game um, with giant updates coming constantly. I know my Xbox is pretty full of COD. Um, So basically (laughs) what they're saying is the additional support uh, for the drivers will enable the firmware uh, update that, uh, sorry, to allow, uh, it's a um, M.2 SSD drive expansion slot. So are they available to buy? Are you buying just like basic uh, M.2 drives or do you have to buy uh, a Sony one? So Sony uh, were like, I think they had one or two supported NVMe drives right when the console launched and they were like this will obviously expand over the next year as people start to develop and we create the firmware to support Mm -hmm. um the uh, that's it's it's an interesting thing to me that they've launched this console with that slot um with a mind to have that uh expansion and not support it at the start Mm -hmm. um 
there weren't enough games to fill up the drive at the start anyway. So I guess that's a weird reason, (laughs) sure. But Uh, obviously, like, yeah, you're mentioning that is there a reason that they didn't want to do this? Are they not hiding something, but is there a cautionary uh, issue with that? Because the firmware update also unlocks a higher cooling fan speed to ensure the consoles don't overheat. Uh, So does that bring into mind uh, the idea that maybe running extended storage could cause your little PS5, little, I don't know why I'm saying little, <laughs> could cause your giant PS5 to become a giant radiator at uh, the back of your TV? Well, like, uh, maybe. <laughs> you know, like, we, we've had a lot of um, reports of people being more satisfied with the sound of the PS5. It, it's a much quieter console because of the giant heat sink in it. It's a much quieter Compared console the than the PS4. Um, no, than the PS4. The PS4 is, like, the loudest yeah, console right. ever built. Um, <laughs> and this thing has been much quieter, but if they're going to have to crank fan speeds, you might get a bit more of that high, higher pitched whirring noise. Um, yeah, right. If it's got to punch out a bunch of air to cool up the SSD slot. Yeah. Um, more storage is good. People are going to want it. Um, I know you haven't filled yours up yet, but no, it's and like I, when I, a terabyte becomes 666 gigabytes or something, it's like, Oh yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of PlayStation in on this on this hard drive. So totally, where can I put all my games? Yeah, and I know it is definitely not the case for everyone, let alone the majority probably in Australia. But I like to hope that as internet speeds sort of slowly creep up around the nation, that more and more people do you know download and uninstall games uh, more and more. So hopefully, larger storage isn't something that's crucial for people. Um, but I, I do understand that yeah, it's one terabyte is actually not really what you're getting in this. So the ability to chuck something in there and have your whole library ready to go um, as long as it doesn't turn it into a a little hotbox is a good thing. Again, like uh, we said this when we first saw this break, this teardown video, that slot is really easy to access. It's not like like you need uh, to be comfortable with pulling machines apart. It's going to be really simple. It's a single screw. so people will be able to upgrade their storage really quickly. I still wonder why it has taken them so long to, you know, it's still somewhere between July, June, July, August that it's going to come yeah. out, right? So it's like, I, I wonder why it's taken them so long. Maybe it's because they're building the, the firmware support for a broader range of SSDs. I was going to um, say, if it comes down to sort of not negotiations, but like making sure they've got the spectrum of drives covered so that they will all, or the majority will work or deals to make sure there's no nothing that's going to be incompatible possible. Yeah. And of course, the greatest thing about the PS5 is how quickly it can access all the data on the machine. So Lightning fast, Peter. It's lightning fast. So... Uh, <laughs> making sure that this you know this new plug-in um ssd is going to perform in the same way that the internal one currently does because that would be really disappointing for people to install a game on their nvme drive and for it to run even at like 15 percent less efficiency like will feel noticeable if a seven second load time well, a no second load time becomes a, a four or five second load time again. You're like, what? Massively, What's especially it? when like this has been the highlight of the next gen- this current this current next generation, which is purely down to like loading times. It's just the thing that everyone has been shouting from the rooftops and, and I'm enjoying it. I'm looking forward to a Series X to see how fast that loads. It's like the second you start, that starts to take a hit for any reason. I feel like that could be a big um, negative thing to attach to your console. So yeah, yeah, maybe they're just more time in the lab at the moment. This guy just pulling apart more PS, PS5 and putting in more slot firmware. They're doing it one at a time, which is why it's taking them so long. It's probably why. Um, moving on. Oh, I just want to quickly point out, because Miss oh, Silver Leet points out in the chat that um, the proprietary solution for Xbox, obviously, was the uh, counter to this seemingly really consumer-friendly M.2 installation from Sony. Uh, mm-hmm. Xbox has the, like, proprietary plug-in Little... SSDs. Um, yeah. They... Uh, maybe 15, 20% more expensive per terabyte than you can find like consumer M.2s on sites and particularly good deals and stuff. But Mm. uh, the tech itself is like really impressive and has really good cooling. And so it's all of that, the process that PlayStation are going through now to make sure that anything you plug in works properly was done by Microsoft ahead of time. So it's like, that's the the trade-off is like you pay more for something that you know is going to be really effective 
Um, and hopefully PlayStation nail it so that anything you plug in is really effective um, mm. as long as it's a supported SSD. So Totally. And obviously it's such good heat, um, you know, um, cooling in those um, M.2 drives because of that little heat sink, Pete. The, the, yeah, the, the little, little heat sink that the, is uh, bigger the little than heat my sink. car. Yeah, but the little plastic heat sink thing that you stick on the back. Remember, you peel it off, you stick it onto the uh, onto the drive. When we installed that, oh PC, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, that was we totally knew what we were talking about. <laughs> I've never seen one of those before. Exactly, and they're very common. They're very common. Um, <laughs> why don't you jump on to the next story? Because I only just breezed over this before we got started. Oh, me too. Um, so, oh, good. Well, why uh, don't uh, I let you read that one? I'll go for it then. <laughs> I just got to change the uh, titles and stuff as well. You just want to drink oh, your well, tea while I update titles. It's uh, a coffee. So, uh, uh, E3 2021 online event cancelled. Bow, bow. Bow, bow. More uh, sad news. We thought there was only one sad news story. <laughs> Welcome back to sad news. Play the news. sad E3 menu music. <laughs> Play the anthem music behind this. <laughs> <laughs> of course, E3 2020 was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and while the... Um, ESA, which is an acronym that I don't know what it actually stands for because it's not electronics specific. support America, Sexy electronics America. support America. Uh, sure. Earlier this year, the ESA suggested that we are transforming the E3 experience for 2021 and we'll soon share exact details on how we're bringing the global video game community together. Uh, and they were working with LA Live, a production, a local production team to um, put together an online event was the assumption. Um, Which is what we're seeing with heaps of things like BlizzCon Line and stuff like that. Like everyone's basically found some sort of digital compromise to say like this is how we're doing our announcements and stuff like that. Um, but this not working in the way they wanted. Yeah, it looks like uh, we're not going to see anything this year. Um, maybe 2022, 2023 is when they'll have the, all their eggs in the right baskets for making an online E3. Uh, do you think we're missing like we're out? Be... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, do you think we're missing out on anything this year because of the like? Is E three? We've talked about it year on year. Uh, the last couple that we went to before we then stopped going, and it was almost to the point we we harped on about this a lot. But like, the, is E three relevant anymore? Um, and then something like a pandemic comes along and and says, what's the point of having this event, even a digital version of the floor event, if all your um, all the people supplying content to the convention are doing it digitally themselves. Um, yeah, are we missing anything because of no, this? We are not missing anything. Sure, that's I agree with you entirely. <laughs> everything that any publisher wants to say will make its way to us. <laughs> like, yep. it's not going to stop them. Um, the, we are missing something in, I still feel like E3 as a community event for gamers was uh, important. Yeah. Um, uh, we're getting... A little bit of a drip feed throughout the year which is nice uh, we talked about this on the playstation thing as well how um separate like spreading out the announcements means you have more time to soak up the little bits that come out as opposed to like a lot of the little things kind of get left by the wayside because you're like there's so many announcements that you kind of latch on to the top 10 whereas yeah. here we get to see everything because and I guess one thing that might that you do miss is the idea of all those journalists going along to it uh, and then hunting up through the, the show floor, going obviously to the major interviews, speaking to the big publishers, but then finding something that catches their attention. And often that will go, that'll spread between everyone who's there being like, hey, we check this little thing out. Um, and then before you know it, there'll be a little like indie darlings or a couple of little things that pop up that become the mini heroes of E3. And I feel like it, that might get lost in a digital realm because, yeah, there isn't the ability to go to the Devolver tent and find that really fun little game or even just like that one eye-catching little stand that uh, is showing off something a little more ambitious because it's it's just lost in the in the, the lack of screen time it might get now. Yeah, I think you're right in that like there are some smaller things that can't be found just because it made sense for Devolver to have them on their booth or for uh, uh, whatever was hidden behind the Fortnite truck. <laughs> <It's a beer. laughs> we got some space back here. It's really cheap. They get the best spot on the floor and then the Fortnite truck just pulls in front of them the day yeah. before. Oh, come on. Yeah, and then like, yeah, a man wearing a tomato on his head standing in front of your desk all day. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I don't think the audience loses too much. Like the people that weren't attending E3 don't lose too much. Sure. Um, because they still get to see everything eventually, except maybe a few of those little things. But uh, 
yeah, there's definitely, uh, we are in the very fortunate position of having been able to attend a thing like it. And it like, mm -hmm. it's it, like PAX being missing last year, you know, it's like, there's this, there's this energy that it gives you to like, it's a new, it's a renewing of your love for the industry. Totally. Uh, yeah. And I think the industry is important to celebrate beyond games are cool. Like this was a, this was like, there's developers here. There's like big publishers here. Like we're interviewing and talking to these people who feel so, uh, we feel so disconnected from. And again, yeah. Nintendo are the only people who do a good job in the directs of putting those people in front of you and giving you faces to uh, like, to put behind the games that that make them more personal whereas like uh, like assassin's creed people are happy to go assassin's creed looks fucking shit because they're not worried about <laughs> the, the people that made it or mm -hmm. or hack cyberpunk uh, hack city project which is still happening like the you know, this studio is being like put through the ringer um mm -hmm. because of some awful decisions that the management made all of the staff that work there are suffering because of it <laughs> and uh, it's funny. I feel like it's easy to disconnect yourself from the people that make these things. And this, yeah. was a, this was a really good moment to connect with the people that make the things. And and totally, like there are some personal situations and anecdotes from when I and, and you went as well. But I think, and what we're seeing here is some footage from um, back in the day, old Good Game uh, Classic E3 coverage, where we got to have some really personal interviews with these people and put faces to names or faces to games, I guess is a better way to put it. And uh, like, for example, I remember going one year and playing, I think it was The Crew 2, a game that really didn't like stand out on my radar in any way. But I spoke to the devs, they were really lovely Ubisoft developers. Um, they were a great team. We had a really fun chat. And then after I went and played the game on the big screen and they all stood behind me watching me play it. And like, they were just ecstatic to see someone playing it and being excited about things. Like I'd see something cool and go, oh, wow. And then I'd look and they were just watching me being like, I was yeah. like, oh, it was so lovely. And we filmed that and we put that up. And again, whatever you may think of the game, it's just like, it gives you a new One appreciation. <laughs> totally, but, but it gives you a new appreciation for that. There's a team of hardworking people behind it and any, any, a excuse to be able to let them step to the front of the stage is great and i feel like now i now i just want to go to e3 and hear uh, and meet the voice of the e3 uh, of the state of play trailer and be like oh, you're that person it's like that's all the personality that those things can really carry with them now versus yeah or yeah. such rehearsed developer spiels it's not the same thing yeah we know we don't get any ecstatic Peggle twos anymore. No, exactly. Uh, so E3, uh, I guess, officially cancelled. Uh, long live E3. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but of course, I'm sure there will be heaps of gaming announcements uh, and uh, all sorts of digital events happening in and around that time, which is usually sort of what, like late June, start of July kind of thing. Yeah. Um, American summer, uh, winter. So something still hopefully to look forward to there. Evil uh, Spy Boy says E4. E4, bring it bring on. It on. <laughs> uh, that is a wrap for all the news we felt was relevant to talk to you guys or to you guys about uh, for this Monday. The first pinch and a punch for the first somewhat daily backup of the March uh, at the moment. But uh, that is... <laughs> it's, it'll catch on, Peter. It'll catch Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, that is a wrap for all of the news of the Somewhat Deadly Backup. Other than that, I think that's all the housekeeping. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday, as Pete mentioned, and the big show on Thursday. Keep your eyes and ears peeled, especially on the Twitter account of The Pockety, where we'll be announcing what's on the show later on this week. All right, let's back plugged it up. Plugged away. We all plugged up, Pete? I think we're plugged up. Let's plug, we're let's, plugged up. Let's so plug let's up back and back out. <laughs> Bye. See you later.